Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone here today and this special day, which is Father's Day. We're certainly glad to have everyone, and we're especially glad to have the fathers here today. And later at the end of the service, we'll be recognizing all of our fathers on this special day. I'd also like to welcome everyone listening by way of WITB Radio. We're always glad to have you and would invite you to tune in at any time that you can be with us. If you're visiting here this morning and you're a visitor, we're certainly glad to have you. We'd like to invite you to stay after our services, get acquainted with us, and also attend a Bible class, and we'd certainly like to have a record of your attendance. If you're a regular member here, we also would like to have a record of your attendance. would like to know anything that's involved in your family at this time, any special needs that the elders might need to know about, certainly put that on the uh, attendance card also. But Please give us a record of that and any notes that need to be made there also. Before we enter into worship this morning, as Tyler Temple will be leading the singing for us this morning, I'd like to read from Psalm 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter to his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, his truth endures to all generations. Let's stand as we sing.
Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we thank you for another day. And we thank you for blessing us with a good night's rest last night. As we come together as your body, your Lord, we declare you God. We declare you the creator of heavens and the earth. We know that you sent your son to die in our place for our sins, Father. And we thank you for that. And here in just a moment as we commune with you, help us to remember uh, how blessed we are to have a God like you. One that loves us so much. And God, we just thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for uh, being consistent and just always being there throughout time. And Lord, help us to carry that message to our, to our families and to our children that, that you will always be there. And God, we ask that as uh, your people and your body here, we pray for humility. We pray that we can be humble, especially when we talk to those who don't know you and don't know your love, Father. And we pray for open doors in our lives, that those who don't know you and that are away from you, that we pray that we can have conversations with them. And they may see those, see you in, in our actions. And that time comes, Father, we pray that we will have courage to open our voice and to tell, tell them about you, Father. So we pray for occurrences. And we pray that you will open those doors, Father. And as your body here, we pray that we can study and, and just um, have confidence that your word is truth. And we know that it is, Father. As we study and as we learn and grow together father we ask that you will bless us in that we thank you for your word we thank you for just telling us how we how we should live and, and how uh, how to have wisdom and god we just ask that you would bless our leaders here the elders and the deacons we pray for their work and we pray for many doors to be open there as well and we pray for all individuals here and we just pray that uh, whatever they're going through father that you will um, be there for them, and, and may they realize that, Father. But God, we just most uh, especially want to say thank you for Jesus. He's our Savior, and we know that there's no other way to you except through him. We recognize that, Father, and we just humbly say thank you for it. And this morning as we continue to worship, we want to, to declare you God and just um, tell you how great you are, Father. And we want to ask this prayer in Jesus' name.
as we prepare ourselves for this memorial supper as part of our worship, it's a special part. Christ asks that we remember him in this supper. And Peter reminds us of our call for holiness in Christ before God. And I'd like to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 21, as Peter exhorts the Christians there. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we continually reveal Christ to ourselves as we, as we study his word and as we encourage one another in our worship faithfully until God calls us home. So it's not a sometime event, it's forever 14. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here, in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, us, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Let us worship him now in this supper. <clears throat> Holy Father, as we come before your throne, we're so honored to have been each one of us appointed priest under our high priest, Jesus Christ, that we can use him in his grace and you through your guidance can help us to grow, to be closer to you each day, to be more effective at encouraging one another in steadfastness. Heavenly Father, as we partake of this feast and we partake of this loaf, help us remember our perfect complete Savior who lived as we live but without a single sin disciplining himself to turn from it each time it came and to keep himself pure so that he would be a spotless lamb so that we could have our sins forgiven Heavenly Father we're so thankful for that sacrifice we're thankful for this memorial supper that we can honor you through him be with us, Lord, as we partake of this. Amen.
worship and our prayer before you in the name of Jesus Christ. And we ask as we partake of this fruit of the vine that we remember that it is the blood of an innocent, one that has not sinned, unlike us. And we're so thankful for the grace that it brings to us. For we do fault and we have to keep correcting ourselves and we're thankful that you're there for our confessions. Heavenly Father, be with us as we partake of this. Amen. continue our worship by giving a gift to God of what he's gifted to us actually and so let's pray before we make our offering Holy Father as we pray we pray Heavenly Father that at this time we might be thoughtful and have prepared ourselves to give richly to your cause and we pray that we might remember that our giving is our giving of our lives and our time and our efforts and our prayers so that we might be of help to others and not just live to ourselves. Help us, Heavenly Father, and be with us now. In Christ's name.
Our scripture reading this morning will be Matthew 6, 9 through 14. In this manner, therefore, pray our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debtors. As we forgive us as, as we forget our debts and forgive our debtors, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Good morning. It is good to see everybody here today. We're glad that you're here. Glad that we had this opportunity to be together, to worship, to spend time together. Uh, it's Father's Day, and more will be said about that after our services in the closing part as uh, we recognize all of our fathers and do all that fun stuff. But it's been a busy week uh, between camp and everything else. We just finished All Ages Week, and I think there were 16 or 17 of our number that were out there. And this Sunday, of course, is Pee Wee Weekend, so we have a good number out there as well. And then this afternoon will be the beginning of Teen Week, so we have a lot of people going out again once back. The uh, camp is right outside of Marion, and uh, the road is well-worn all around there. And so that, that's a good thing to be going on. Also, this Tuesday, we will be hosting the Summer Youth Series. Uh, we made the determination this year that uh, we would host it during Teen Week. During Teen Week, it, the attendance drops about 100 to 125 because of so many people going to the uh, Teen Week at camp. And so, usually on this week, we go to the smaller churches because there's about 200, 210, something like that. This year in the meeting, all the smaller churches asked not to be in Teen Week because they like having an absolutely full building. For them, it's a wonderful feeling to have 400 folks in their building and to hear the singing and just be able to take pictures, more or less. And so we volunteered to take Teen Week, and we decided we'd move it out to the pavilion, and that would give a little bit different feeling since the numbers would be down. It would be a good experience for all the kids. So... If you're a parent of a teenager, please help on Tuesday. We'll be setting up the chairs uh, Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon, and we'll be cooking hot dogs and uh, hamburgers as well. And so if you're able to come help, able to come serve, that would be a good thing for you to be able to do. If you don't know how to serve, as far as like what way you can serve or whatever else, just ask me and uh, I will direct you to the people in charge as soon as I figure out who that would be. No, just playing. All right, so... As we get started, I want us to, on this Father's Day, to talk about who is our Father, our Father who is in heaven. Now, that's a picture of me way long ago, 1986, uh, the month of September. Uh, it was the sequicentennial, which I'm not even sure still if that's a word, even though that was 30 years ago. But that was the 150th birthday of the state of Texas. And so we had drove, I guess, 40 miles to go find a wagon train. These guys had the best job ever. They had had a wagon train, and they had uh, driven all over Texas in their wagon train and fixed chili for everybody. And we had just finished being in line, and we'd gotten the vittles, looked at it, went behind the wagon, threw it away, noticed that the ground was covered from everybody else throwing the vittles away, and come back around, and somebody offered to take our picture, so we took our picture. Now, you probably have cuter pictures of your dad. Hopefully you do. And hopefully you have memories that are sweet, memories that are good, and memories that bring you good feelings even today, whether your father is living or whether your father has gone on to his reward. I think God created mothers and fathers for many reasons. One is to train their children up, Ephesians 6, 4. Another one is because we learn who God is from the relationship that we have with our parents. Uh, many uh, psychologists and such will tell us that for many people, the view that they will have of God is in, ingrained in them in the first few years of their lives by the authority figures they have when they're first born and when they're first forming their very personality, who they may be. 
And for many people, that is a great thing because they see a father and they see a mother who is loving and supportive, a mother and a father who will discipline, but they discipline out of love. Sometimes that's not such a great thing because some people don't have great memories of family life growing up. And sometimes we don't have a father. Sometimes we don't have a mother. Sometimes it's not a good situation. And if you're in that situation or if you're in that case, rest assured that God loves you and that God is your father and that God disciplines, God loves, and God knows exactly who you are and he will never leave you nor forsake you in any way that there can be. It's interesting thinking about the idea of God being our father. Because when you run through the Old Testament, you very, very rarely see the idea of God as a father. You especially don't see it in any of the prayers. But when you come into the New Testament, you see all the prayers of Jesus. And as you read through all those different prayers, there's only one of as many prayers that he does not address God as his father. And so it's interesting seeing the change from the Old Testament to the New Testament in a way in which that works. And I think it's something interesting for us to study and to look at today. And that's why I wanted to go through the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6 as we see where Ken just read for us, our Father who is in heaven. Well, let's see why it's important to have God as our Father. Let's go to our first slide. Well, why is it important to have God as our Father? Well, first and foremost, He is all-powerful. You remember being on the playground when you were a kid, and my daddy could do this, and my daddy could do that, and, you know, comparing back and forth, you know, who has the best daddy, and who has the strongest daddy, and who has the most important daddy, going back and forth. Well, there's no one on this earth, no one in heaven, if, as a matter of fact, anywhere that's stronger than God. When you and I read there in Revelation 4, we see the God of people who are oppressed. There is John sitting on the Isle of Patmos in exile, seeing many of his friends, or the apostles, having already been put to death. And there may have been some temptation for him to think, maybe God's not strong enough. Maybe the God that I serve can't really protect me. Maybe the God I serve is not really there for us. And so he had that vision on that Lord's Day. He was called up into heaven, and he saw the throne room scene. And he saw those four beasts falling down before the Lord. And he saw all the cherubim and the seraphim and everybody else all around yelling out, singing praises unto God. And as he sits, sits there in Revelation 4, he sees the absolute amazing power that God is. And he sees who God can be. Psalm 62, 11, David the psalmist says, All power shall forever belong to the Lord. Uh, Hebrews 12 and verse 29 reminds us, that God is a consuming fire. Perhaps you've been out west and seen some of the fires going through the forest out there. Or perhaps you've been in a house fire where once the fire gets going. When a fire finally gets established, it gets moving, whether it be a wildfire or a house fire, there is very, very little that can stop it. Yes, you may be able to bring in water. Yes, you may be able to try to build a fire line. But it is very difficult to stop a fire until that fire actually wants to stop. Well, that is the illustration given concerning God. When God makes a decision, when God makes a direction to go, there is nothing, nothing that can stop it. There's no one more powerful than God who is there. But you see, God is our Father because He created us. Each and every one of us has the breath of God within us. Now, some of us are pretty, some of us not as much. Some of us are very close to God, and some of us not as much. But every one of us within our hearts has the image of God stamped upon us. Has the fingerprints, the DNA, if you will, of God the Father. For we are created in the image of God, and so God has formed us and created us. But we also see the power going on beyond that, just who is a father... He's someone who found something, someone who has started something. Abraham is called the father of those of faith, Romans chapter 4 and verse 16. Satan is called the father of lies, John 8, 44. God is called the father of truth, in John 17, 17, and also 1 John 4, 16. We see that all things, all truth, 
comes from God. What do we mean when we say that he is the founder? Well, it means he's the one who started it, the one who began it. Folks in the Commonwealth of Kentucky oftentimes talk about James Naismith, the one who founded basketball. He, he discovered the sport and created the sport. It looked much different back in those days with those peach baskets and such, but he's the one who started it. And folks in Kentucky like to say Kansas started basketball and Kentucky perfected it, right? That's what we oftentimes will say about that. But as you and I think about a founder, we see it someone who has come up with a plan and who has put that plan into work. We see it's the one who is the expert upon it, the one who is able to start it and make sure that it was carried to its fruition. In the same way, God is a father of salvation because he is the one who before the creation of the world had in his mind the power of the church and the importance of his son dying upon the cross. Before we were even formed in a womb, God had a plan for each one of us in life. And he knew where we were going to go. He knew what we were going to do. And he knew the issues that you and I would face even today. I feel like a flashy preacher up here. The lights are flashing. That's not just me, right? Okay. Every once in a while you're like, "Uh uh-oh, things could get rough here soon. All right, so God is our father. Let's go ahead and go to our next slide. As we talk about this idea of God being the father... We see, well, how in the world is he the father? Well, first and foremost, he's a father because he came to us through creation. Hebrews 3, 14 and 15 tells us that he has created the heavens and he has created the earth. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 13 tells us that he is the creator of life. You see, God is the one who's in charge. Now, oftentimes, when we are in a time of trouble and distress, especially as a young child... We want to find the one who is in charge, who can take care of us. Maybe you remember being a young child and being lost in a mall or being lost in Walmart or a grocery store. And you can imagine this young child who wants to find his mother, wants to find his father because that is a place of security. And as soon as that child can latch onto that dress of her mother or as soon as that child can find where his father is, he feels that sense of security which is there. But that's how we should feel with God. Because God created this world, and God is the father of everything that there is. Whatever it is that you face, whatever it is that you go against, God is in charge. Secondly, we see that God is the father of Jesus himself. We look there in John 3.16, you see a very fascinating passage. It's called the key text of the New Testament. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but should instead have everlasting life. What's that word only begotten mean? The Greek goes back to the word monogenes. And perhaps you remember decades ago, many people, even in churches of Christ, used to debate exactly what that word meant when they're going through Bible translations and things such as that. You see, God is the father of Jesus in a very special and specific way. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 35, we see where Jesus was created when the Holy Spirit visited with Mary. Now, think about this. Every person here has a mother and a father. And every person who has ever lived has a mother and a father. You go all the way back to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were created, Adam from the clay of the ground... Eve was created by the rib of Adam. But you see, Jesus is different than Adam and Eve and every other person who is around. Because Jesus had Mary as his mother, but Jesus biologically had God as his father. Now, that's an interesting aspect, but it shows the closeness that Jesus and God had together. It shows to us that God became man and dwelt in the flesh among us, that he tabernacled with us. It shows us that God left heaven where things were comfortable, where he had the glory of the angels, and he came down to this earth to live as a man. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. And so God specifically is the father of Jesus in a very, very special way. But also, God is our spiritual father. 
Now by that, we mean that as you and I as Christians turn to Him, we develop a special relationship with God. In one sense, God is the Father of creation, and thereby He is the Father of every single person. Whether you're good, whether you're evil, you receive blessings from God. It rains on the just and the unjust. Whether you're righteous or whether you're unrighteous, God is your Father. He is the authority figure who is over you. But when you and I become Christians we develop a very close relationship with God. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, when those people obeyed the gospel of Christ and became New Testament Christians, they were entered into a special relationship. Acts 2, when they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? In verse 37, Peter replied to them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we see in verse 47 that they were added to the church that day, those and all others who have been uh, obedient to God, obedient to the gospel. And so when you become a Christian, you truly, spiritually have God as your father. And you develop a very close relationship with him. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 speaks of how he, his spirit, now dwells within us. Now, that is a very special thing because you go a little bit deeper... And you see a word mentioned twice in the New Testament. And it's a word oftentimes misunderstood by folks. And one of the places that word is found is Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. Where we have a spirit within us so that we can cry out, Abba, Father. We see that passage also in the book of Galatians. Well, you and I read that and we see Abba. And if you're like me, you think of the band from over in Europe. And that's not what that's talking about. It's a special word for father. And Paul, by the inspiration of the Spirit, says you have been given the right to use this word to speak of God the Father. Now, there will be some who say, okay, well, Abba is just a, um, it's a casual way of talking to God. And so they'll stand before the church or they'll stand or they'll kneel beside their bed and they'll go, hey, daddy, as they're talking to Jesus and talking to God. That's not what the word Abba means. Abba is Aramaic for father. It's a very respectful term, but it is a term used by Hebrews of their home language. And so it is a word which, when you leave the country and you come back, you feel a special kinship when people finally start speaking the same language that you speak. And that is what Paul is speaking of right there. He says, you now have somebody who speaks your language. You now have somebody who is of your culture. You now have somebody who understands everything that there is to know about you. Now, that doesn't mean that you can treat him casually. It does not mean that he is no longer worthy of respect. Because, yes, he is still a consuming fire. And he is still the judge and the perpetrator over all the universe. But it does mean that you and I now have a special relationship with God. And it's a relationship that cannot be taken away. It's a relationship that any person, no matter what they may think of you, no matter what they may do to you, cannot remove from you. It's a relationship you have with God that is very, very special. Peter puts it this way, while not using the word Abba. He says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, He has given unto us the divine nature. You and I now have that spark of God within us when we obey the gospel. And we have a special relationship with God so that he will always, always be there for us. And so let's look at how this lesson applies to us and what it is we're talking about when we talk about God the Father. When you think about God, recognize he is your Father. Now, of course there's discipline. You see in Hebrews 12 that he will discipline those whom he loves. And as you read there in Hebrews 12, looking at verse 3 to 9, you see that aspect of discipline. We oftentimes see those who raise their kids. Uh, there is a love which goes with discipline. It would be a lot easier when your child messes up, when your child does something which is socially inappropriate, to just ignore that child, to let that child go on. It's a lot easier for us to keep watching TV, to keep sitting on the internet, or to keep doing what we're doing and just ignore the child, no matter how inappropriate it might act. 
But when you do so, that child will not learn how to live. That child will grow up to be spoiled. That child will grow up not being shaped into a good person. Many people expect God not to discipline his children. And they say, if God loves me, my life needs to be perfect. If God loves me, every whim that I have needs to be met. If God loves me, I should not face any trials in my life. But God loves us. And God shapes us. And God helps to create or creates us into the person we need to be. And so, yes, you and I have a loving father, but that loving father oftentimes will discipline us, will shape us, and will mold us. James puts it this way, chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. He says, Consider it pure joy whenever you face these trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. But... Greater than that discipline is God's love for you. That's what I want us to come away with today. Is God's amazing, absolute, full, complete love for you. He is obsessed with you. You see, God has looked at us and he's given us life. We see in John chapter 3... Verse 3, that he has given us the new birth so that we can be born in the spirit so that we can share in this kingdom of God. God saw me and he saw all the mistakes. He saw all the shortcomings. He saw all the sins. He saw all the problems. And yet even though he saw that in me and he saw that in you, he loved us enough to find a way to give us life, to give us grace, to give us mercy. Your Father loves you. Going beyond that, we see that God has given us love. Love, oftentimes, in our culture, sadly, we feel like it has to be deserved. And so many of us have gone through life always trying to earn somebody's love. And whether it's enough cards, whether it's enough good things to give, whether it's enough money, whether it's enough good works, whether it's enough romance, whether it's enough of whatever, we hope to attain someone's love. And there's a lot of parents who don't raise their children well because they're so anxious and afraid that their children are not going to love them. And there's a lot of children who strive and strive every day and try to make their parents happy because they think that's the only way that their kids are going to love them. But know this, your Heavenly Father loves you. No matter if you're not a Christian yet, God loves you. No matter if you've already obeyed the gospel, God loves you. Even if you've been a Christian for decades upon decades, God loves you. And he's obsessed with you. And he wants absolutely what's best for us. God has promised each and every one of us rewards. He sees the need that we have and he meets those needs. As Christians, we're told we're never going to hunger. We're never going to thirst. God will provide for us. As Christians, we're told don't worry about the things that the pagans worry about. Because you have a heavenly father who knows you and who loves you. As Christians, we see that through faith, he rewards those who diligently seek after him. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. God loves you and he will provide for you. And he will be there for you. Now what's interesting is every person falls short. And there's not a one of us who's perfect. And those who have raised kids can look back over their career of raising kids and they can see the good things they've done and they can see some things that they may want to change. And every father, as he looks at life, even if his kids are still in the home, may have regrets and may see some shortcomings that they have. Know this, God the Father does not have regrets. God the Father is full of all wisdom. And he knows exactly what he's doing in our life. 
And he will reward those who diligently seek after him. And we see that God truly communicates with us. We see that he communicates with us through creation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. We see that he primarily communicates with us through the word of God. And that's what's found here in our Bibles. God communicates through us, through providence, through the people who have been brought into our life. And God communicates through us, through our heart. Because we know in our heart that longing that we have for him. And God communicates through us in all those different ways. But as we compare those four things, the place that you'll know what you need to do to be pleasing to God is found in this book. Because, you see, hearts can be deceptive, and they can lead you away. Creation shows the existence of God, but it does not lead us to everlasting life. People who are around us may love us and may want what's best for us, but we need to go back to the Word to see what it is that God wants us to do. You see, God is a loving Father. Let's go to our last slide. That's the point that you and I need to get across today. God, our Father, loves, loves, loves you. Now, on this day where we recognize the God-given role of earthly fathers, and I think it's good for us to do it, we see men who are doing their best, trying to provide for their families, trying to provide in a way in which shows love and support and goodness. And our culture, especially our culture, needs to celebrate fathers and the good hard work which they do. Spiritually speaking, today we should celebrate our Heavenly Father. The one who has created us, the one who has sustained us, the one who has saved us, the one who has blessed us, and the one who has made a place in heaven for us to be with forever and ever. Praise God for his wonderful gift to every one of us. Now, at the end of every lesson, we have a time of invitation. And it's a time for us to look at ourselves and be sure that we are what God wants us to be. We may be judged by other people, and that's for good or for ill. But as you and I stand before God, that's where it really matters. Because God can read our hearts, and God knows who we are. This morning, if you have not obeyed the gospel and become a Christian, this is the opportunity for you to do so. As you listen and understand the word of God, we see the importance of knowing who we should be and what we should do. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17. As you and I know that word, we grow to trust God or grow in faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. And he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him, Hebrews eleven six. As you and I learn about God and begin to trust God, we grow in faith. And we begin to change our lives. Instead of living selfishly and just doing what we want, we learn the importance of being a servant. We learn the importance of putting off the old man and putting in the new man. We learn that no longer should we be conformed to this world, but instead we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. We learn the importance of the good confession. That is, being willing to admit to others our belief in Jesus. Being willing to tell others about the love that Jesus has shown to us. And we then are baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. As you and I read in our Bibles, we see that baptism is not something done after we're saved. It's something done in order to be saved. Now, some people will tell us that that is a work salvation. It's not. The water does not do anything special, but it's the act of a good conscience towards God in obedience. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. It adds us to the Lord's church, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. And it is the result of obedient people wanting to come to the Lord. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. So this morning, if you need to obey the gospel of Christ and become a Christian, this morning, if you need the prayers of the saints, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.
As we go to our Father in prayer, we need to remember the family of Tony Williams. We need to remember Pat Jarrett and Roger Jarrett, Brad Hall, Bill Hicks, and Mary Lou Levan. Will you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, it's been good to be here this morning, and we pray that your name has been praised and honored, and we pray that each one here has learned something that we can apply to our lives to be better people, to be better Christian people. And we pray that we have been edified by being here this morning. Father, at this time, we want to remember the family of Tony Williams and his passing. Please be with Terry and Josh and that family and give them comfort and strength at this time as only you can give. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to be with Pat and Roger Jarrett as they are going through difficult times in their life now, and we pray that Roger will be able to come home soon. We would ask that you would be with Brad Hall with his upcoming surgery this week. Give him strength, and we pray that everything will be successful in, in that endeavor. We pray, Father, that you'll continue to be with Bill Hicks as he recovers at home, and we pray that he will continue to get better, better so he can be with us as soon as possible. We pray, Father, for Mary Lou LeVan, that you will continue to be with her and give her the strength as she starts her rehab and help her to continue to get better, be with the doctors, be with the family around her to give her the strength that she needs. And we know there are others of our, of our family, Lord, that need special prayers at this time and special needs, and we pray that you will continue to be with them and heal them and whatever their need may be and be with their family and friends as they comfort them. Father, be with us the rest of this week. Be with us this morning as we continue to go to Bible classes and learn more about you so that we can live our lives in accordance with the way that you want us to live. And forgive us when we fail you, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As mentioned in the prayer, our sympathy is expressed the family of Tony Williams and his passing Monday. And Tony is a husband to Terry Williams. And they were both former members here at the Benton Church. And he's a father to Justin and, and Josh Williams also. Pat Jarrett is in room 405 at the Stilly House. And she does have a phone in her room and she would love and appreciate phone calls. Roger Jarrett is continuing uh, down in Paducah at the nursing home. But he's hoping to come home this week. So hopefully Roger will continue to do well with his rehab. And will be able to come home sometime this week. That's the hope at this time. Brad Hall has been diagnosed with melanoma and will have surgery on Thursday. And, of course, the family asks for our prayers. Bill Hicks is home and feeling much better and still using a walker and confined to his home. And he wants everyone to know how much he appreciates all the cards and calls. And he sends a message to all that he will be back soon. And I wouldn't doubt it if Bill's at the skating rink in a couple of weeks knowing him because he... He's, he's a tough old bird, and he still likes to skate, so I imagine Bill will be getting better. Mary Lou LeVan uh, is doing, seems to be doing well uh, down at Superior Care as well as possible after a broken pelvis, but she's in room 312 and appreciates all the visits and would like to have some short visits, but uh, starts her rehab tomorrow. Let's hope that that goes well for her. If you need to know more about that, of course, ask Jeff, and I'm sure he can fill you in on that. I uh, would like to recognize that uh, Will and Mallory Carnes are here with baby Noah. It's good to see them. And great-grandmother Doris Harper is also here. So it's good to have you all here with us this morning. Uh, also, this morning, there will be a short informational meeting in the high school classroom for all high school students interested in the canoeing trip on the Buffalo River, which will be Saturday, July the 8th. This meeting will be immediately following a worship service here and before Bible class begins. For any chaperones that would also like to come, please contact Russ Kirby or Tyler Temple. And Mark mentioned this earlier. Or no, not on, not on this one, my mistake. This summer, instead of having our regular VBS, we're going to be taking a trip to the Ark Encounter in Williamstown, Kentucky on Saturday, August the 5th. The church will be paying the admission costs for all children that will be attending. Adults will be responsible for their own tickets. A bus will be provided for anyone who will need a ride that day. And for more information, please see Luke Phillips or Aaron Lyles for that. Also, the Red Cross will be here on Monday, June the 19th from 1230 to 530. 
please plan to come and donate blood if you can do that. It's much needed. This is what Mark mentioned earlier. Tuesday, we were hosting the Summer Youth Series at 7 p.m. Again, we were asking members to bring already cooked macaroni and cheese, chips and cookies, uh, chi macaroni and cheese, chips and cookies, and have them at the building by 5 p.m. on Tuesday. If you're willing to help, please see Mark. Also, last week, um, Paul Thurman uh, let the elders know that uh, at this time in his life that he would like to step aside as deacon. It just uh, Paul, Paul has served for many, many years in the capacity and, and finances primarily and also with the cemetery. And as you know, most of you know, Paul retired from the banking business, his career, very successful career in banking. And we really appreciate Paul's service. And Paul has done such a wonderful job in so many areas, areas that we appreciate that. But we wanted to communicate to you that it's Paul's wishes at this time that he, he not be his deacon, but that he will remain very active in, in whatever is needed, I'm sure. Sonny wanted us to know that we have a family in need of a bunk bed. And if you have one to donate, please call the office or contact Sonny Rommelman. And then next Sunday, I think the last announcement I have, next, next Sunday there will be a shower table set up in the foyer. It's for Emily Holly and baby Brody. And the shower had to be rescheduled because of baby Brody's early arrival. But mom and baby are doing, doing very, very well. So remember that. And Jerry, you have an announcement. And then after Jerry has an announcement, I'll have just a couple of more things. The Benton Christian Scholarship does a special donation once a year, so annually. Uh, next Sunday, after a regular contribution, we'll pass the plate again for Christian Scholarship Fund. Are there other announcements, anything that I missed need to be restated or other announcements this time? If not, of course, it is Father's Day. It's been said several times, and we want to recognize, always try to recognize mothers on Mother's Day and fathers on Father's Day. If you are currently a father, kids in the foyer, okay, that, that might help. Okay, all kids, right? You want all, all kids to the foyer, okay. All kids to the foyer. If you are currently a father, or a stepfather, or if you've been a father in the past, we would like for you to stand at this time. If it's convenient, stand. If not, raise your hand. Father, stepfather, or father in the past, please stand. And I've been told to tell you, too, that uh, what you're getting as a gift has, has a sharp object on it, so be careful, and don't give it to children. So... I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's not a gun, I can tell you that. So. As they're passing those out, Lori, can you pull up God is so good? We appreciate all the fathers because we are the spiritual leaders in the home. And the fact that you're here this morning says a lot about your leadership and we appreciate you we need more spiritual fathers in this country that's for sure let's sing God is so good and then we'll be dismissed to Bible class God is so good God is so good God is so good so good to me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He's so
answers prayer. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. He's so good to me. We're dismissed to Bible class.